everyone. Thank you for listening to the first webinar as part of our 2024 CKF webinar series. This session will focus on the pre, during, and post-transplant world of intestine transplants. My name is Anna morgan Pilardi, and I am the Program and Communications Director for the Chris Clue Foundation, otherwise known as CKF. And I will be introducing today's panelists and moderating this webinar. I'd first like to thank our partners today for today's webinar, Transplant Unwrapped, who are doing wonderful work to support individuals in a transplant community. Thank you to all those who have submitted questions before today's se session. If you have further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chriskludfoundation.org. If you're interested in any of the other topics we have discussed in previous sessions or this, coming up this year, head to chriskludfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. Now I'd like to introduce today's panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves and the organizations they represent. So first we have Swapna, a uh, small intestine transplant since 2014. Thanks for joining us. And I'd like to give you a moment to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And thank you to the Chris Clug Foundation for having me and, and hosting this webinar with, with all of us. Uh, I'm excited to, to be here. My name is Swapna Kakani. I, as Anna said, I received a small intestine transplant now, uh, I cannot, cannot believe it, uh, nine and a half years ago, and I will be celebrating my 10 year transplant anniversary this June. Uh, I was born with a rare GI disease called short bowel syndrome. And because of it, I was not born with all of my small intestine and what remained was anatomically and physiologically inadequate. And over the years, I've had a lot of surgeries to try to correct it. And I be, was uh, since birth have lived on nutrition from an IV and a feeding tube. And um, unfortunately, over the years, developed a lot of complications and lost vein access to receive IV nutrition, uh, which then I became a candidate for a transplant in my 20s. And now I can eat to my heart's desire uh, and do receive um, tube feeding through a, a feeding tube to maintain health. Um, and now I have a, a healthcare consulting company where I help healthcare companies and associations understand the patient perspective. Amazing. Congratulations on your near tenure. Near tenure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm yeah. excited. And thank you for all of your work uh, to, to promote the cause. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Garrett, who is a small intestine and kidney transplant recipient. Thanks for joining us, Garrett. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, you guys. Um, so I make, uh, I share my journey living with a rare medical condition called chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction. And it's basically uh, where my intestines are um, ballooned and um, dilated so much that they don't contract. So all my nutrition comes from TPN um, and, and I have an ostomy and a G-tube and I just uh, I make these videos sharing and trying to normalize them in a funny and comedic way. Uh, I had my transplant actually last November 11th, 2022, and the last surgery, uh, July 6th, and now I can eat fully. And um, yeah, it's been sharing that journey ever since. It's been really great. Thank you, Garrett, and thanks for sharing your story. It's really important to get, to get most uh, journeys out there. Um, and finally, we have Wendy, who is a small intestine transplant recipient and board member for Transplant Unwrapped. Thanks for joining us, Wendy. Thank you so much, Anna. <laughs> I'm really grateful to be able to uh, to be here today um, and to be able to uh, to speak with everyone. Um, I received my small bowel transplant in February of 2022 after uh, about 12 years of being sick. I had a traumatic bowel injury in uh, 2010 and it led to a series of complications leading to multiple surgeries and uh, you know a, a series of complications that um, that led to my bowel essentially becoming paralyzed. I couldn't eat, um, I couldn't uh, digest foods 
and I had a number of different surgeries. I lived with an ostomy for some time, had my entire colon removed, um, and lived with TPN for a number of years when I couldn't eat or digest uh, any food or other nutrition as my my co-hosts have, uh, have described. And when I finally um, came to a point where I was unable to even process the TPN, I became a candidate for the uh, small bowel transplant and received mine in February of 2022. Um, it was through the, the small bowel community and my preparations for the surgery and just trying to understand and make sense of what happened that I became involved with the support groups and with Transplant Unwrapped and became a board member with them. And Transplant Unwrapped has um, become a real part of my life. And uh, I was really grateful to become a board member uh, within the last year. You know, our mission is really to ensure that every patient and caregiver um, and member of the intestinal disease community feels really well educated and supported throughout their journey with intestinal failure, intestinal rehabilitation, and intestinal and multivisceral uh, transplantation. And we offer a number of different resources, including websites, virtual support groups, webinars, and a social media presence in the form of education. Um, posts um, and the, the support groups. So um, it's really become a place online for people who are going through anything related to um, the small bowel, um, intestinal failure, intestinal rehabilitation to find resources and uh, to be able to reach out to others who are going through something similar. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Wendy, and, and thanks for everything uh, Transplant Unwrapped is doing. It is so important. Um, if I've learned anything from, from working in this field, it's education and support is key um, when you're going through a transplant, both for the recipient and, and their loved ones and caregivers. Okay, let's get started with some questions. Uh, first, Kwapna, can you tell us about your experience of waiting a small intestine transplant and how you felt when you received that call? Yeah, of course. So I kind of want to backtrack a little bit because I think it brings up an important topic of evaluation, especially for intestine transplant and multivisual transplant. Uh, given be, or being someone who's had this disease since birth, I've actually, I got evaluated for transplant three times over the course of six years at three different centers. And be why that happened was because I was young and the disease definitely changed and evolved over that time between when my first evaluation was at the age of 18, uh, right entering into college to when I eventually got the transplant at 24. And uh, we went to different centers because of their specialty and getting and being a subspecialty center that can do intestinal rehab and or transplant. And we were referred to different centers based on their expertise, based on my need and the disease severity. And unfortunately, my the disease did get more serious. I, had, I resulted in a lot of complications after gut rehab surgery that may have, that really uh, correlated probably with the anatomy and physiology of my gut. And just the, the way this disease has advanced over time in my own lifetime as well. And I wanted to bring that up just because I think this will become more common in the space of, of people connecting to subspecialty centers to have access to these experts and follow them, but not necessarily have a transplant immediately when you consult with them, but maybe over the course of time as the disease progresses one way or another, but most importantly, you have access and you've been referred to the subspecialists, the experts in the field, which we all know with rare disease, unfortunately, not everyone we need is in our backyard. Uh, and so I just wanted to say that, that it, it was normal for me to be, to go through this pre-transplant process for quite a number of years. And I wasn't actually listed until, um, 
really one year before and I was in the middle of college. I could not eat or drink uh, and I was completely dependent on IV nutrition. I did not have my small intestine or large intestine that was taken out in a surgery before to fix other issues. And I was completely fed by an IV and tube and all my GI contents drained into a bag. But I had this mental stamina and physical quality of life that I did not have before because before I had severe complications that left me bedridden. And I told the team, next step is most likely a transplant, but I want to go graduate from college because what if, God forbid, something happens and I can never go back to school after the transplant? I want to know that I graduated from college. And at 23 years old, that's what was on my mind. That's all that I could think about. And I thought about the friends I was leaving and they said, yes, go, go graduate. And it was only six months away from graduation. So I graduated and gave the commencement address and then kind of did my proverbial bucket list. I wanted to go see the Pacific Coast Highway. I wanted to go attend my cousin's wedding. I waited six months until I said yes to going from not active to active on that same transplant waiting list at that same center we were were talking to. But that's the third center we had been to. And I got, I, we moved from Alabama, 12 hours away from home. Um, My dad and I moved and we left my mom, my brother, my extended family. We have 20 family members here um, for the, for care. And I know that not everyone can do that. Uh, I recognize that. And we made sacrifices as a family ourselves. And the main um, income breadwinner in our family had to stay home and work. Uh, And we moved on January 1st, January 3rd, I got, uh, no, I became active on the list. And then just 15 days later, I got the call. And that is a short amount of time. I recognize that too. It can really range in in intestine. It can really range depending on what organs you need. And what's unique about this story is that I was so determined to see this entire city and do as much as I could before I would have to go to surgery that they called us right after I left the botanical gardens, right after I left the butterfly house and had just taken two pictures of two butterflies, which as you we all know is a symbol of metamorphosis, transformation, and even a, a logo and symbol for Donate Life. And so I don't think that's some random coincidence uh, that I got the call that transformed my entire life soon after. And of course, I was shocked. I was excited. And I said, can I come in 30 minutes? I have to go collect some stuff. They said, no, you got to be here in 10. I did not make a bag because we had moved to the city, found a place to live all in the span of less than two weeks. And uh, it was a very mad dash. And something that um, a friend did that I tell as many people as I can, it was a huge act of kindness. She surprised me with a video of my family and friends sharing their well wishes for a transplant that they had prepared beforehand. And she gave it to me in the hours before I went to the operating room. Uh, and it's a mix of emotion. It's It's our hope, but I never forget the donor and thinking about what they were going through in that exact moment, the days ahead, and of course the years in the last last 10 years. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, and it's been a journey ever since. Um, I don't think they tell you all the waiting time there is between getting to the hospital and actually going to the OR. But I, but, um, I also like to share is that I, I wrote my conviction. So something else with intestine is um, maybe unlike just a soul liver transplant, many are outside of the hospital, living a life, an adapted life, but outside the hospital. And um, I had, I journaled a lot of my convictions of why I was having this transplant at this age and the intangible, intangible gains um, I could have after to really capture my hope. And I feel strongly in the ability to articulate uh, your desire, both by speaking, writing, and all your senses. And that journal was such a key uh, tool in those hours before going to the OR. That's all I had. And it was this, it gave me this confidence that I didn't expect 
because you're FaceTiming with family that are not there. They can't be there. My mom was trying to get on a flight. It was trying to somehow make it and she didn't. She didn't make it by OR time. So it's it's those things that you grab onto um, before before you, your life has possibly changed. Thank you for sharing. I, I definitely, that's beautiful. Um, the butterfly is <laughs> that really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I, I couldn't agree more. I see a lot when we're sort of talking to transplant recipients. There's so much going on in your world. And there's so many changes and so many different voices pulling you in every different direction and finding that sense of what you really want to focus on and and holding on to that um, can be so important um, through the process. Um, Garrett, let's move on to you. Uh, what did the transplant process look like for you and how did your life change during the time from receiving your diagnosis to receiving your transplant? Yeah, so, uh, so like I said before, I've always been IV nutrition dependent. I had like a a Hickman or Broviac since I could remember. Um, and, and I've basically been, uh, on TPN for like 30 years. Um, I, we tried the G2 and we tried tube feedings and they just ended up not working. And eventually we got an ostomy, but when I was a kid, the doctors always said like, Hey, um, we don't know how this is going to go, you may want to consider transplant because um, we, we don't know if this is going to be like a good life. And, and at that time, like I was seven and back in like the nineties, like the, the intestinal transplant, having one is like a Hail Mary. And they, they were like, yeah, like you'll, you can get like two good years out of it. Um, maybe like the longest person we know that has survived is like five years. And if you think about it, like lasting till you're 12 years old, is not exactly like a sick life. And so eventually, you know, life progressed. I decided to pursue, uh, dancing professionally. And even though I was dancing with an ostomy and a G tube and a Broviac, um, I could, you know, I was, I was able to like progress, but there was coming up to a time where I was spending a lot of time in the hospital, um, because of sepsis and my, my intestines, they were, um, being perforated a lot. And they, I was getting sepsis because of, of the, um, leakage from my stomach into my, from my intestines, bacteria in my intestines into my bloodstream. Um, they were transmigrating. So, uh, one day, one day in the hospital after surgery, they recommended that I get one. Uh, we waited two more years until they brought me into clinic and really kind of put their foot down and said, Hey, like we can't take care of you anymore. We want you to do this. And I was at the point in my life where I was getting a little, I was getting pretty depressed because I couldn't see my life going and living a future that I was was healthy and and was and I didn't want my worst nightmare is to have like a slow burn of like you know and I don't want to go out in a blaze of glory just kidding but um but yeah I didn't want a slow burn and when and I was taking steps to you know make my life better make myself at least feel better and and not give myself a hard time so when they brought that up, I thought it was like, oh, game over. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we 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 kind of recovered from that. And we I said, like, hey, let's let's just see the workup. Let's have a workup, then decide if it's good. If it's something that I'm there, like, hey, you'll do good for it. Let's let's do it. Uh, we did the workup in um, 2022. And that whole time. I wanted to just get my mind and my body right because if I was going to do it, I wanted to go and fit. I wanted to go give myself the best chances. I wanted my mind to be like, like the sports mentality of like, I'm going to crush this. I didn't want to think about any other outcome besides doing well. Um, so I would like, I would avoid like too much information on the subject. Um, I didn't want other people's experiences dictating how mine would be. 
Um, and then, and we, you know, we got it November 11th. I was on the list on July or in June or July. We waited like six months, around six to five months. And the week before um, this, they called me, they told me that, hey, like, I was only going to get an intestinal transplant, but my surgeon was like, hey, like, let's get you checked out for a kidney transplant as well. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. I, the day, uh, the day came and I went to get a kidney biopsy. They sent me home because my blood pressure was too high. So I, we ended up not getting it. And then that night I got the call and they said, we have the perfect match for you. Um, and then, so it really ended up being the perfect timing and we, we did it. Uh, I woke up and my first thoughts were, <laughs> my first thoughts were, and I went in like pretty prepared, like ready to go. Um, my first thoughts when I woke up was like, what have I done? Like, did I came in so confident and I, and I was thinking, did I just make the biggest mistake of my life? Um, because you wake up with all these IVs and like in your neck and, you know, everywhere. And, and I was just like, oh no, a feeling of dread came over me. And I was like, it's okay. Like, all I have to do is just focus on surviving in this minute, being as happy as I can in this second. Then we'll go a minute, then we'll go. 30 minutes, five minutes, like an hour, just really like second by second. I felt like, like all I, all I can do is like survive. You know, that's, I can't have doubt in this. Yeah, but it, it was the right choice. I was, I, it took a while to fix. We had complications. Um, but overall, like the best decision I could have made in my life. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Garrett. Yeah, I think I want to pull out something you said that um, and that you didn't want to hear the information. And that's we see that a lot of different ways. Um, we have a lot of transplant recipients who are reaching out who want to hear everything and they want to know every little detail. And then we have recipients who don't want to know um, and they just want to go forward with, with the decision. And neither one's right. It's just the decision that is right for you. Um, so don't feel pressured either way. Um, but there's always resources out there, such as ourselves, Transplant Unwrapped. Um, just reach out if you are looking for help. Um, next, I'd like to move to Wendy. With your experience as an intestine transplant um, recipient, what advice would you give for a candidate and their family as they await transplant? I think the most important thing to realize after you've made the decision is that there's nothing you can do to impact the wait time. And I think that's one of the hardest things for people um, sometimes to remember, you know, there are people that get the call in days and there are people that wait months and years and there is nothing that you've done wrong. There's nothing you could do differently. And it's really just making sure that you have the right match um, and the right um, antibodies for you and, and your donor. And the most important thing during that time is just making sure that you're ready for surgery, that you know, you're staying as healthy as possible and whatever that looks like for you. Um, that you're keeping in touch with your transplant team and making sure that they know um, if anything is happening in your life that's different. Um, but I know that, you know, I waited four months for my transplant. I think Swapna said she waited two weeks. And, you know, Garrett, it sounds like waited about three. Is that right? Three or four? I, I think I waited like five months, but yeah. Five months, yeah. And, you know, I know other people from from different groups that, you know, have waited years because they're waiting on multiple organs. They're waiting for, for multivisceral transplants. And even, even some for an isolated small bowel who have waited over a year. And um, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And, you know, because 
bowel transplants are not limited to regions. It's not about where you live. It's not about, you know, priority. Um, and so uh, it's really just about making sure that it's the right match for you, that, you know, everything is lining up. And so, you know, really, what are the things that you can do during that time? You can pack a bag. You can make sure that you have, you know, extra long phone chargers and all of the things that are going to make your extended stay in the hospital comfortable for you. You can make sure that you have communication plans laid out with your friends. Um, however, that's going to best work out for you and how you want to communicate during that time, how your family wants to handle communications. Um, and, you know, just as as we were just discussing, you know, what do you need to know? Do you need to um, know everything that that's going to happen during that surgery? Do you need to not know? There's no right answer to that, but would a support group help you? There are support groups out there. And sometimes knowing that you're not alone, knowing that you're not the only one who's going through this or who's gone through this is a really powerful mechanism. And those groups are out there and available and there are people who will look at you and say, I understand what you've been through and that's a really powerful thing. But again, what can you do during that time? Just be patient and it's the hardest thing. I like to chime in on that. I think that's great. I think all those are like great idea. Pack the go bag, get the things that are going to help get your Netflix um, list ready. And just like, also just like live like your life, like just do whatever you can to like get your mind off of it and, and enjoy as much as you can, because there's really nothing you could do besides be prepared. And then you just wait. So that's what I did at least. I just tried to enjoy my family. We did it. We I got into sports and and just did as much as I could to uh keep my mind away from that, you know, the overlooming um call, you know. <laughs> yeah, if I can add. I mean, I know I'm <laughs> 2 weeks is very different than multiple months. Uh but in the in the planning and thinking of it and should we even go in this direction? Um, I, I made the decision to try to th like dive in and think about it only one like few times a week or only at set periods. And that is much easier. I know realize that's very easy to say and much harder to do. And with practice, it got easier because I could tell I was getting consumed by the thoughts uh, quite frequently. And if you ask a hundred people, like 50 will say, go for it. 50 will say, don't go for it. And there was a point that in any decision, um, is there any, any medical decision, personal medical decision, really any personal decision, uh, you have to own it yourself. And there can be an act of paralysis when you, um, have maybe when you, uh, I maybe keep on asking for external, um, augmentation or external validation when it has to come from you yourself. And it is truly like living your life and then taking that time to separately think about it and figure and realizing what is your, what are your boundaries? Like I had three women that I, that were my mentors and those were the three people I talked to. And, and then beyond that, I said, okay, no, I can't, I can't bring in more, uh, more opinions or more voices. And at that time, unfortunately, we didn't have the support groups that we have today. It's been amazing to see the growth of this supportive community in the last 10 years. Uh, and, and so it was us just like, who is out there who has an intestine transplant? And, and we would really stick close together. And that, that was the, the network, but it was like five of us, if, if that, but really living your life and setting the boundaries that help you be able to take on to tomorrow. 
Here, here's the thing I did. I, I was lucky enough to have a support system and like my mom helped a ton with like the caretaking and like the helping schedule appointments. So instead of like, there would be nights where I would just wake up with like immense like <gasps> kind of thing like, oh, did it happen? Or when the phone, my phone would go off when I was sleeping, I'd be like, this is it. You know, I'd wake up with a bunch of adrenaline. And then I told them, I said, hey, like, don't call me anymore. Just just call my mom, you know, and then then we can we can like work it through her that way. I can like get good sleep and things like that. So but I was I was lucky enough. But if you do have that option, I definitely try to go that way. If that causes you a lot of anxiety. No, my heart would skip a beat every time I saw the hospital area code. Oh my god, me too. I'd be like, all right, this is it. And it never was. And then when I, oh, and then my phone died the day I got the call. I just turned it on to take pictures of those butterflies. Seriously. And then I got the call. So definitely keep your phone charged because that's like a sin (laughs) waiting for a transplant. (laughs) Thank you all for sharing. Yes, definitely use those, you know, you have around you. And and we do have that tool in social media now that that wasn't uh, a tool um, back um before but you know you know when to use it when it might not be a fit for you but utilize it um to to as much as it can can help you um Garrett speaking on the fourth topic of social media you've become a force for the medical medical community on social media what inspired you to launch this presence and why do you feel it is so important to share your story with others so I've never had anybody, like Swapna was saying, she didn't know anybody who had an intestinal transplant when she was, when she had it. And growing up, we never knew anybody who had like my condition either. And the people we did kind of know weren't in reach of us either. Either we, we knew one person who was like in college when I was, um, when I was in elementary school and we just knew of the person and there was like no resources. And even when I got my ostomy, there was a magazine, but there was really like, you couldn't hit somebody up and be like, Hey, (laughs) what's it like for you? Yeah. And so I was like, you know, originally I didn't want to like post about my medical condition because I don't want people seeing me as someone as sick. But then I, wanted to like you know I I wanted to be a dancer and I wanted to be you know I guess I'll quote unquote like the successful person in my own right without um that other stuff right but but then I was like you know it's gonna help a lot of people if I'm more public about it and it'll help younger people like where I was in when I was in that position give hope to and I I just want to make sure I'm always like really honest with how I'm feeling. And even though it's like more of a comedic video, sometimes it um, it is like, it is truthful to who I am. And I'll always be honest with like, these are the mental like health issues I'm struggling with or like, or like these are what I'm trying to overcome. And, and um, I think that in itself is, is helpful and healthy. So people can feel seen and 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 feel like when they feel those things, it's okay. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, definitely. We see often people think transplant is a medical fix, and you're done, and and everything's fixed and better. And that isn't the case. It um, there's a lot of steps that come with that transplant, pre-transplant, post-transplant, for all those surrounding you. But there is a community here that's going to pick you up and. Um, carry you with us and we're always there to support you with whatever you need. Um, but thank you for sharing your story. Um, so I'm going to come off of the back of that and you began a career in the transplant world and became an advocate. How did you go about working and starting your career post-transplant? Yeah. Uh, so it actually was because of the transplant. I had this immense desire to increase the patient's voice. It was I think it was a mixture of the fact that I was 24 years old when I had the transplant and I had just graduated from college and trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life. And 
also this reality of have, needing to recover from the transplant. I had multiple complications in that first year and knowing that I, I still want to keep on moving forward and living. And I had, I had education goals, uh, loved public health and had, how can I make this all work? And, and then I was in the hospital recovering from the transplant. And I think being 24 and being, um, having all the experience I had bef uh, up till that point saw, I could not unsee what I had seen in terms of healthcare delivery. And it's like a light bulb clicked. And it was like, I went through my own, I became an adult in healthcare. And I was, I was disappointed in how the patient's voice was not heard very well. And it was a lot of work to make it be heard and be valued as a team member in this process. And I think also having come into the transplant with a wealth of knowledge and wisdom from living with short bowel syndrome, intestinal failure, TPN, tube feeding. And then they say, well, your life is different now. We have check in with us about every single thing. And then there's a part of me saying, there's a lot of wisdom that I have. How can we work together to create management together? So from that, I started sharing my experiences um, as I was going recovering from transplant, both complications as well as the highs and the lows. And as you said, it's not, it's not a cure. It can be, uh, we hope that it's not an exchange of hardships, but it can be an exchange of hardships. It's another form of a chronic disease. And um, intestinal fail in intestinal failure, uh, transplant is the last therapy option um, on that road. And so it, it is, we, so I wanted to show, I wanted to show it from the patient's perspective. What is this really like? And how can we work together and really elevate the wisdom of our community and help change how healthcare is delivered, both in intestinal failure at management, as well as for those who do have to go through transplant. And uh, started giving, I like public speaking. I'm the few people in the world that are I'm not afraid of public speaking for better or for worse. So I started saying, hey, I can give talks. And honestly, I just one day started a Facebook page and did not know what I was doing, started an Instagram page. I'm a firm believer of work with what you have. Uh, I knew how Facebook worked because I was 24 and I knew how Instagram worked, but I didn't know beyond that. And in those times where I had to just be at home, rest, recover, I studied people on social media. I studied uh, mentors, uh, people I looked up to, other young adult females who had chronic disease experience that were speaking out about it, reading blogs, figuring out what how are they getting engagement and getting people to listen to them in the healthcare space? And so slowly that has evolved into figuring out how to work with companies where they would appreciate your perspective for employment. And that's continuing to evolve. Uh, and the world is vast in healthcare. And I'm not going to lie. I started out saying, I'm going to change healthcare and clinicians laugh at me. And I get it because it's a very, it's a very complicated field. And I advise anyone who, I think all of us, like who re, who are using our own experiences to make a difference in the support in uh, how we navigate this journey from whatever angle is to really take one day at a time, learn from every uh, relationship and every effort that you do is important, be it the email, be it the talk, be it the relationship building, every single part is important. And you will find your niche. I think I've, I've put a lot of arms out there to figure out what sticks, what do I like to do, what gives me that energy that keeps me going, but also where is the need and how can we really keep on um, pinpointing that need and making sure patients and families are taken care of. And it's not the, the hardships we've experienced are not repeated for the next generation. And that's what keeps me up. 
Uh, that's what wakes me up every morning. That's where I don't want to see the little girls that live down the street from me who do have short bowel syndrome, who are born with the same etiology to live the same healthcare delivery issues that I have. Thank you. Yeah, I think definitely becoming your own advocate is so, is so critical. And there's never enough people advocating. Um, I, learned, I moved over to the U.S. from the U.K. and I went in to get my driver's license. And someone said, would you like to become an organ donor? And I fully admit, I stood there and went, oh, what? What, what is that? It had been something I had never, ever, ever had any experience with my entire life. And I, you know, left and asked my husband afterwards, I was like, what? What were they talking about? What does that mean? Went back and researched it, ended up a few months later becoming involved through my brother-in-law, who is now on the transplant wait list. Um, for heart, I suddenly realized that I'd led this completely sheltered and I'd had no idea that transplant was really a thing and something I should explore. And suddenly I went diving into the world and now I work <laughs> for the Christian Foundation. I fully went on board. Um, but you don't have to go that far, but definitely there's not enough of us out here advocating. If I could live my life not having any idea, then there's others out there doing the same thing. And I think that us sharing these stories and empowering other people to do the same is, is so critical. Um, so if you're on the fence, definitely reach out. Um, there's multiple organizations out there who will help you share your story and support you through that. Um, Wendy, I'd like to pass it over to you. As a board member for Transplant and RAP, you have helped other patients and candidates going through the transplant process. What have been some of your greatest experiences and takeaways through helping others in the community? And do you feel that's helped you through your transplant process? Yeah, I think one of the, the greatest things about Transplant Unwrapped and coming together in community is really about uh, seeing people connect and finding people that have gone through similar things that, that you have and really realizing, you know, this is such a rare disease. It's such a rare surgery. It's such, you know, everything we have is rare. And even within that, none of what any of us have gone through is the same. Um, and there were only 83 small bowel transplants done in 2022 in the United States, which is the lowest of any solid organ transplant um, that is done. And so it's, it's really unbelievable that we can come together in community and still when somebody says, has anyone else gone through X that we say, yes, I've gone through that. And just to see the relief, because so many times all we hear is, you know, you're really unusual. No, you know, you're, nobody else goes through this. You know, you're really um, a rare patient. You know, this is really unusual. Um, I'm going to send you to someone else. And throughout, you know, the chronic illness that most of us have endured, you know, you keep getting passed off. You keep getting... Um, sent to someone else, sent to different specialists, and you never really, you know, as Garrett alluded to, you don't find people who have gone through even similar things to what you've been through. And so in groups like Transplant Unwrapped and other support groups, when you're able to find someone you know, not even the transplant, but even who have gone through similar procedures that you have, who have gone through, you know, similar failures that you have. It's very, very powerful um, to have those similar experiences. And one of the other new groups that we're starting in 2024 is a caregiver support group because the intestinal community is so different that the caregivers have such unique experiences as well, that we're coming together and creating that option as well. And so for me to be able to watch and experience that 
has just been so powerful and to be a part of it and to be able to share my experiences, to be able to meet people that I've met through support groups. You know, I spent time this week with people that have now had their transplant surgeries that I met through support groups and just to be able to sit with them and say, it gets better. I know that I know what you're feeling right now. I've been there. I remember it. And I can tell you it gets better. Just hold on. And that's really powerful. And, you know, I'm not even two years out for my surgery. And, and I, you know, I, I wish that someone had been able to do that for me, you know, when, when I was in the, the thick of it. Um, and so for me, I find that really powerful coming together in community and being able to provide that option of community to other people who also find it powerful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing more powerful than connecting with your community. Um, and Transplant Unwrapped is definitely a way for you, you to do that. Um, I just want to touch every recipient has a different relationship with their donor and their, their donor family. Um, Wendy, can you talk to your relationship with your donor family? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Anna. Um, you know, right after I got home from my surgery, I received a letter from my donor's mother and she had written a letter to everyone that had received um, a gift from her son. And the letter just read, you received um, an organ from my son, Rowan, and he was 10 years old and uh, he loved math and sports and engineering and uh, he loved dogs. He wanted to be a canine handler. And uh, it just said, I, I hope you're doing well. We miss Rowan so much. And um, I just started writing to her. And the first year after your transplant, you don't have direct contact with the donor families. It's all through the Gift of Life Foundation. And I just kept writing to her just to tell her how grateful I was. And I sent pictures and told her, you know, that I was on that precipice between life and, and death when I got that call. I really wasn't doing well. And um, receiving, um, receiving the gift from him saved my life. And I got a call from the gift of life um, about a month after my one year transplant anniversary asking if I'd like to have direct contact with my donor's family. And I hadn't really heard from her after that first letter. I had just kept sending, sending mail. And I said, sure, absolutely. And, um, and we got in touch and she just started sending me through text message, all of the pictures and we ended up FaceTiming and it all, um, accumulated in, um, my donor's mother, father and brother coming and visiting on what would have been his 12th birthday. And um, we've been in touch ever since. Um, my brother, who is a police officer in Campbell, California, and they named a canine after um, my donor, Rowan. And uh, I got to, to meet canine Rowan this summer. So we, uh, we've really tried to, to honor Rowan and, and make him a part of, um, of our family. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, uh, my brother-in-law was a donor and um, his uh, mother received a letter from, from his recipients, uh, a number of them, and she hasn't been able to write back, but she 
definitely cherishes them there in her top drawer. Um, and they sit there at such a important connection, whether you have a direct connection or not. Um, that relationship is always so important um, and, and critical. Um, I'd like to wrap this up. I always wrap up with the same question. If you could give one piece of advice to an individual or family awaiting their transplant or who have just received their transplant, what would it be? And I'm going to pass it out to all of you. Um, I just want to say, like, no matter what you're going through medical hardship wise, it's possible to live like a happy and fulfilled life. And don't give up on on not on don't give up on being happy because you you can find happiness in so many different ways and the world works in so many unique ways that it'll find you too uh that was very nice garrett i don't know how to follow that um i was gonna say today does not dictate tomorrow uh, there have been many days pre-transplant as well as post-transplant, be it the first couple years or even now, where you may have mentally, emotionally, physically, you feel consumed by whatever is going on in, um, in the body, in the mind, um, external forces, and I, I live by that every day is a new day. And I, and to second what Garrett has said, there, there's, there's always hope. Hope is an action and to never feel like you, you are alone or you have to give up. And there's so many of us that understand and will be right alongside you um, to help remind you. And I would just say, you know, you, you may feel broken, but the pieces are all there and you get to put it back together in the way that makes sense to you. And that's the power of hope. Thank you all. That was uh, beautiful. Um, so that is it for today's session. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their journeys. Thank you for tuning into today's session. We hope you found it inspiring and informative. Again, if you have any questions for today's panel or want to learn more about uh, this year's webinar series, head to chriscoyfoundation.org slash webinar series. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and live life get blessed.